But first, let's go to that push for more housing. Exposed is nothing but a bit of a farce. New building approvals are down. The rental market is tighter than ever at 0.7% in terms of vacancies. And there's a big fat lie at the heart of the Prime Minister's so-called help to buy scheme. The expert who's going to make sense of it all is our Sky News business editor, Ross Greenwood, who joins me now. So let's start with those new housing numbers, Ross. This is the data of housing approvals. The forecast for January was a 4% boost. In reality, we only got a 1% boost, meaning that over the past 12-month period, we've had just 160,000 new dwellings approved. Now, that's a long way off the 240,000 that must be built annually if the government's got any chance of meeting that 1.2 million target. What's been the reaction of industry to this data? Well, the reaction is the same as it's always been, and that is that the target, ambitious though it might be, is almost unachievable. Uh, and the reason, uh, as we've talked about before, is if you're a builder or a developer, I spent some time with a few of them today, as a matter of fact, they tell you, quite frankly, if you can't make money or you've got a significant risk of making money when you're going into a building project, you just simply don't build. And so that's the key. And then what you've got in many of the states, but particularly in Victoria, is additional tax on property owners that simply take the, well, the incentive away for anybody to want to build. So you talk about around the nation as to what's taking place to try and achieve this target. You know, Victoria should be building around uh, a third of those homes, the 240,000 homes, which is the target of the Albanese government over the next five years. So mm. it'll have to build about 80,000 homes a year. Now, the reality is right now, it's building around 51,000 homes. So you can see how far short of the target it is. The long-term average, strangely, over 10 years is about 64,000 homes a year. So even that is well below the target. So the reality is right now, when you've suddenly had property owners in Victoria having an extra $4.7 billion snipped out of them by the Treasurer at Tim Palace over the next four years, and at the same time, you've even got business having $3.9 billion in additional payroll tax taken from them, there is no surprise right now that Victorian home values are rising at the slowest pace of any capital, uh, or, or rather of any capital city, or indeed any state right now. Mm. And the reason for it is because the incentive to build, the profit motive, is simply not there. And that's causing problems for the Albanese government that wants to grow Australia's population and to build more housing. You squeeze, though, at, at both ends of the spectrum in places like Victoria because you've got this windfall tax that came in last year where the developers have to pay the difference between what they bought the land and what they then sell it on, you know, so they subdivide it. Right. And that's almost at 50%. So who's going to develop? They're going to land bank, which is why there's so many low housing approvals out of Victoria. At the other end, the mum and dad sort of investor says, gee, I'm sick of the, you know, the playing field changing all the time. I'm hearing the speculation that they're going to come after my negative gearing. I can't afford this land tax on top of everything else my family's copying at the moment. I'm going to sell the house. And stories again today of all of these people that have long held rental properties saying to the agent, just get rid of it. I can't, I'm going to put the money in the share yep. market. I can't afford this. So then you've got that, that market, you know, constricting because people that are buying them, maybe living in them, you haven't got as much supply available. And you've got then this massive migration continuing that's putting pressure on the only homes we've got left in the market. So any, any wonder you've got record low vacancy rates and you've got a lot of stress out there when people can't find homes. And the second aspect of this is, guess what happens with all of that? You actually suddenly get rental inflation coming through at a significant rate. And so as a result, what you've got is inflationary forces inside the Australian economy. So that is not inflation that's been imported from overseas, as the government likes to tell us quite often. This is homegrown inflation. Mm. That, and nothing is being done about this in regards to try and give incentive to build new homes. Remember that uh, Anthony Albanese, at the start of his big target of 1.2 million homes uh, over the next five years, uh, effectively said, well, we're going to put up $3 billion um, of cash. And this was to the states. Guess who gobbled up a lot of that? Victoria. Victoria to try and say, we'll open up to try and build more housing. But the problem is, right on the ground, as you point out, people don't want to build because, A, the risks are too great, 
and the incentive is too little for them to be able to do so. And you've still got all the issues that are historic and not just in Victoria, but right around Australia, of, of the costs being simply too great in regards to trying to build new projects right now um, and even trying to get Labor to build those projects is risky. That's the reason why, if you look around your capital cities right now, you don't see very many cranes. Uh, the developments have pretty much mm. stopped and that is not good for Australia long term. All right, we'll get to health insurance in a moment, but before we leave housing, this help to buy scheme that Prime Minister crows about it, there's plenty of money on the table, 300 odd million from the taxpayer. But you get in the detail today and you find out that only 4% of Sydney properties even qualify under this scheme. Most capital cities don't get much out of the scheme. Well, that's where most people live. So I don't know uh, how good this scheme even is. Well, is it practical? That's the big question. So in other words, is it a little bit of grandstanding? And let's be honest, every government will do something like this, come up with a grand scheme. But, the, but once you start to get into the practicalities, as you point out, it's actually hard to qualify. So here it is, yearly income of $90,000 or less for individuals. What bank is going to lend to you at that annual income of 120000 or less in capital cities, that is almost impossible to buy a house with. So that's it. You must live in the purchased mm. home, no problems there. You can't own any other property in Australia or overseas, no problems there. Able to finance the remainder of the purchase, there's your problem. Because right now the banks are going to look at you and say, you don't have the income to be able to justify this home because there is simply not enough skin in the game for the bank to make it worth your while to be able to, if you lose a job, be able to cope with that. And that's something, again, that the government has got to deal with. All right, let's get into private health insurance. The cynical me says, gee, surprise, surprise, they announced this increase three days or two days after the Dunkley by-election. Uh, that's out there, right? Now, it's 3% or just over 3%. It's less than inflation, so the government says that's terrific. But it's the biggest increase we've had since 2019. It's about 500 extra a year for families. So that's real money on top of everything else. There goes your stage three tax cut. And I fear, this is my big worry, having done health policy in the past, Ross, yeah. is that people are getting to the point where they're saying, oh, I've got to pay my mortgage, everything else has got to go. I'm now looking at whether I can keep my private health insurance. And, of course, when they drop out of private health insurance, they come back into their, the public system and it's already struggling. So it's a really big circular thing. So remember, any insurance um, industry is a big pool. Uh, and the reality is that the people who drop out first are those people who are feeling the mortgage pain. They're the younger people. But the younger people claim less than the older people. And so what happens is you add more risk to the pool if the younger people start to drop out. You're seeing here some of the increases and just what is going to go up. By the way, those average increases, as we're seeing here, is just the average. It's not if you're in the top cover, the gold cover, you're going to get whacked with a whole bunch more. So that's something else to keep in the back of your mind. But as I say, this is remember a numbers game. Now, the increases right now are not as great as what they were going back from about 2002 to 2008, when around, you know, a 40% increase over five years happened. But the real issue that happened mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. could potentially happen now. People start to drop out. It increases the risk in the pool. If the pool has a greater risk, the premiums keep going up and therefore more people drop out. And that is a circular game. You simply don't want any health insurance company to have to face because that makes it even more affordable for people or less affordable for people into the future as well. Spot on in that explanation. I think everyone can follow that at home and that's a real worry. It's the worry about the pool. Ross Greenwood, thanks as always. Great, okay. How good is he? I tell you what, we love him on Sky, don't we?